Greetings, everyone, and happy feast. And I didn't know anybody noticed, but I do have a white dog. <laughs> I've seen him walk his uh, dog up and down the uh, road over there, too. Uh, oh, that's such a cute beagle. Uh, he's a little bit bigger than a normal rabbit beagle, but he's so, they got that beagle face, and the little hounds do, and, and, uh, a, I think you got three dogs. Boy, they, they're all sweet. I love dogs. I love animals. Let's see. I've got that turned on, I think. And um, one of the loneliest places in the world is the graveyard. All these stones around you, you know, big, small, big people, small people buried in these different graves. I can remember going back many years ago on Salem Ridge there in Bracken County and uh, there was this one big graveyard about 500 feet down this old country road behind our house where we lived. And of course it was a gravel, mud gravel road and, and uh, full of uh, sharp rock. During the daytime it would be no problem. I could walk right past that graveyard with the Hulk Hogan look you know on my face right by but you see back in the early 50s there'd be only one television set maybe in miles around you and this neighbor was about a mile down the road past this graveyard that had a television set and I couldn't miss the Lone Ranger when he came on Wednesday night well I stayed a little too long one night and got dark on me and then the I said, well, I might as well stay up and watch the late, 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 late show, which I did with the, the neighbor there. And um, <laughs> it was a full moon that night. I mean, star through them trees there. And if it shines just right on some of these high, expensive tombstones, it would be like somebody back there with a flashlight. I started watching as I was walking. Like, you know, if I walked over on this side of the road, it would be a more helpful, which I did. And as I got closer and closer to the graveyard, then I could see that moon. Of course, it looked like somebody with a flashlight back in there shining around. And I started picking up speed. Let me tell you something. When you're 12 years old, do you know you can run and never touch the ground? I was a booking it when I went past that graveyard. As I walk through the graveyard today, I see the many stones, little stones, big stones, round stones. Then I see a flat stone with the name of Nathan Earl Kelly on it. It has my birth when I was born, but it's blank for my departure. But my wife, Betty Maxine, Kelly is to the right. Her time, like so many others in the graveyard there, have the date of her birth and the date when she departed this life. A date when it all ended. And you know, before I go any farther and forget this, at her funeral, we had James and her son-in-law and myself speak. And I told them, because her family doesn't understand the things that you and I understand, that she was asleep. She was asleep, resting. And the, under, the uh, one that took care of Mr. Palmer, one that took care of, the, of her, and I think he was dead serious when he came to me and wanted to know more about this. I don't think there was no reason he got paid. I mean, there was no reason for him to come and ask any more questions, but he did. After it was all over with, he asked me, he said, what do you mean by sleep? I said, well, read Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, the chapter 15. Read the whole chapter. It'll, you know, I, I'm not going to explain something to somebody that don't want to believe, but if you'll take the time out to read that whole chapter, you'll understand. God speaks of the, you know, of the fathers being asleep. They're not resurrected yet. And I think he might have done something like that because later on I seen him again and he had a big smile on his face and he, he answered a few things that he asked me. He'd already answered, see. 
So we can be an example sometimes and don't even realize it. A piece of time that Betty put to rest. You know, a time that we are born, we grew up, we went to school, we graduated, we found a job, we got married, we raised a family, and we retired. A walk. I walk to the mirror today, and I look in the mirror, which I think all of us should do quite frequently. A scary thing appears in the mirror. An old man. An old man. I can remember back in the, in, in the 50s when I had a 57 Chevy glass packs. Archie knows what that is, wherever he's at out there, he's out there someplace. Glass packs. Nothing any sweeter than when you had them both ready, both hitting at the same time. Boom, 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 boom. I didn't recognize this old man that was looking back at me in the mirror. It's discouraging. I look and say, is that all there is? I've worked all these years, 32 years for United Parcel, going up and down from Cincinnati to to Indianapolis pulling a pair of pups, which is twin trailers, for 32 years, and this is all there is now that I'm retired. Now I got to wonder what doctor's appointment I got this week. I look along and say, is that all there is? There used to be a song out, Anita Bryant had it. Broken down, full of pains and aches. We all want to live longer but not like this. Worries, heartaches, regrets, loneliness, pain, suffering, blame, wrong, the pointing of fingers, so many, including myself, do. Adam lived 930 years. Seat lived 912 years. Jared lived 962 years. His grandson, Methuselah, lived 969 years. Did these long lives bring utopia and happiness? No. Was there peace with anyone? No. A lengthened life does not by itself mean fulfilling happiness and having a happy life. Today we live in a world of awesome progress. Yet we cannot get along with each another. Yes, even in God's true church, we find fault and have our problems with others. But we should be looking in the mirror, looking into the mirror. I challenge you to look in the mirror. Really look deep and see what you see. Mankind is eating from the wrong tree. And don't even know it. Because Satan has done a masterful job hiding the truth. God's truth. Today most people don't know that the tree of life exists. They don't even realize by eating from it will lead to developing the mind of God. And receiving the fruits of God. Holy Spirit. Meekness humbleness, loving, and the biggest word of all, compassion. You do because you have God's Spirit. I would say that most of you in here have been baptized. I don't know. Just think what God has given you. God said to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life. But you must turn your back on the tree of death. Man wasn't to know evil. You know, yesterday we heard a powerful sermon by John uh, uh, Reedy, and he started right to the last talking about the tree of life. And I said, well, how wonderful that is because I'm going to follow right on his footsteps and add another couple of paragraphs to it. Turn to Genesis 2. We'll read that. Genesis 2. 
verse 16. Six, two and 16. And the Lord came, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou may eat. You may eat freely of. You got this beautiful garden. And no telling what kind of fruit they had in there. I, I can just picture the big sweet grapes being big as oranges or something like that. How tasty that would be. Now you get a little tiny one about like a pea and it's as sour as a as, uh, as uh, uh, it can be, you know. Verse 18 says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. And I will make him to help. And she's talking about Adam. But what I was reading, is uh, I jumped a verse. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of. For in that day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This is when death starts, right there. Death starts, and guess what? The graveyards start to fill. The beginning of the doctors, the undertakers, the funeral homes, all start. Everybody running, 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 running to the doctors. Let me tell you a little something before I get any farther and forget it. Um... Talking about running to doctors. This time last year, I wasn't at the feast here. I was in Lexington at the Mackey Cancer Center with my wife. She was three weeks into them diagnosing her with, with uh, terminal cancer. And uh, before that, six months before that, we took her to Mount Sterling. And she had that fancy million, multi-million dollar cat stand that went all over, back and forth over. It took about 90 minutes to complete it. And she was cancer free, they said. Cancer free. Going over and over. She went and had mimograms for her breast. Cancer free. The cancer that was on her foot a couple of years back behind that, that got into the lymph nodes, was all cleaned up. Cancer free. They all said, but six months later, she was dead. Let me tell you, we got this fancy equipment, but nobody knows how to read it. Come to find out it was misread because the doctors came in that morning and we went to take her what we thought was going to be back surgery, her fifth back surgery, excruciating pain going through her body. Two days before her scheduled surgery to take place, we got a phone call from her neurosurgeon, Dr. Tibbs, and UK Medical Center. He said, at 7 o'clock in the morning, let me tell you, 7 o'clock in the morning, no neurosurgeon or no doctor is going to call your house. They just don't do things like this. But for some reason, he did. He said, I want you to get your wife down here as soon as possible. I found something here. We thought it was something to do with her back, maybe a disc or something like that. We thought it was going to be wonderful news. They get down there, they run more tests on her, they come in, and he just flat comes out and tells it. He says, you, you, you got cancer. You got your cancer in your spine. You got it in your liver. You got it in your lungs. You got it in your head. And, he, and she asked him, she said, well, where, where is it at? Where do I have to treat it? He took his hands like this, and he went like that. It's all over. And when chemo is no longer an option, you don't have but days to live. At that first breath you took, you started this life. Short or long, life begins with you. It's, all, it's, it's what we do with this tiny piece of time that God has given you. So many minutes. I don't know how many minutes I've got. You don't either. But God has given you from the first breath you took till when you take your last, and I've seen Betty take her last breath, and I'm telling you right now, it's not a pretty sight. It's not like what you see on television. I can tell you that right now, and I've seen it. And there were some others there with me too that witnessed that. God has given you, like I said, so many minutes. And how much of this time have we wasted? I have 
preach that over and over. Don't waste time. And I catch my own self at wasting time. We can't waste this precious time because God has given it to us and it'll be gone. Now only a memory of the past. Today we live in a world of awesome progress and advancement. Yet we cannot get along with each another. The question today is why the same minds that can fly to the moon and back, transplant hearts, produce computers, technology marvels, but can't solve the very simplest of problems. Why? Why? And I've even heard maybe you have too. I brought this up in Moorhead a couple of weeks ago. There's an Italian group that's getting ready in two years, catch this now, for a head transplant. I don't know whether, hopefully somebody else has heard that besides me. Mark has, so I'm not, I'm not by myself. This can't be possible. This can't be possible, but yes, they're going to work on it. An Italian doctor with his team. Peace in this world, because man is living from the wrong tree. My friends, God is calling only a few at this time. Spring harvest, you have been given the door to eternal life. God is calling you. You wouldn't be here if he wasn't. A priceless gift being offered to you forever. All you must do is follow him, follow his footprints. Why? So many would what so many would give everything they had for the chance that you're getting for nothing. Money cannot buy what God has called you to do and showed you in your mind. First Corinthians. Book of First Corinthians in the first chapter. First Corinthians one. First Corinthians one. And verse 26 and 27. For, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27, this is the reason you and I are here. But God had, he wasn't looking for that, see. <laughs> But God, and, and when he comes to me, uh, you know, uh, he definitely was looking for foolish things. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I think about that sometimes when I read that. I remember going into some of the most big men in, at the, the company, you know, at UPS for whatever mistake or whatever I did wrong, you know, calling me in there. And, and uh, you know, I... I the things I did were foolish, but here it's going to be reversed, you know. They're going to be listening to me when the, that time comes. Foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Just think how he works, how he does things like that for a reason. Be kind, compassion to one another, be forgiving, just as Christ forgave you. A new world is coming, and a new body, as we heard yesterday from John, is waiting for you. And I could go on and on and on over, and he could too, I'm sure, about thinking that the earth is the only one that's inhabited and what it is. You don't know God is so big, it's no telling what is out there that we cannot even see. The Hubble telescope won't go that far. A new world is coming. And think of that. Sylvia, no more pain. No more pain. No more suffering. Alan, in your back, in your legs. A new body. A new heart for James. I mean, think of this. Think of how wonderful this is going to be when this happens. Because you're going to be born again. And when you're born again, as we heard again, that John explained yesterday, you're not going to have a heart defect in a born-again body. Of course, there's going to be spirit. 
Rest your tongue. And remember, God is the judge. Let God do the judging. Rest your mind from this test. You take care of you. Let the world take care of the world and all the material things in it brings. The only thing you can take with you is your good deeds, your love, your compassion, your humbleness. God will know this immediately and he will reward you in heaven. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. And that's this talking about the rich man here. You know, he had much, but he couldn't do what God told him to do. Matthew 19, verse 21. You know, he, he told God that he reminded God that he kept the commandments, all of them and everything like God didn't already know. But he goes on down in verse um, 21 and it says, the young man, verse 20 says, The young man saith unto him, All these things I have done, like I said, from youth. What have I lacked? What do I need to do? And Jesus said unto him, That thou will be perfect. Go and sell all that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasures in heaven. See, what God was doing was offering him a, a, a discipleship. If he would have done all that and followed Jesus, he would have been one. But the young man had plenty and he couldn't do it. And this brings me to another thing, and I'm sorry I'm talking a lot about Betty, but I can't help it. It's been less than a year. She's still on my mind, and I'm still learning from some of the things that she told me. Betty, at nighttime when I was working, would work. She had a big room set up making quilts. And she seen something right there at the last that none of us has seen. And I haven't either. She made quilts. She made beautiful quilts. She sold quilts from five to eight hundred dollars a piece. But right there to last, she called Carolyn Graham in to talk to her. Alan, you was with her too, right? Alan was with her too. I wasn't there. And she knew that if she left the quilts to me, that I probably would took them someplace to a high auction place and see what they would have brought. She didn't want to do that. And I'm glad she did what she did. I feel very re relieved because that would have been hard to do. She called Carolyn to her bedside knowing she only had hours to live. See, everything else was shared with her, her and I. The house was, you know, the property was hers and the property was mine. The car is the same. The furniture is the same. But the quilts were totally, totally hers. And she called Carolyn over there and she said, I've got 17 prime quilts that I haven't uh, even thought about selling or anything, and I want you to give to each family of the church. Now think of something that you got, going back to the 57 Chevy or something like that. Think of something that you got that is so precious to you, means everything on this earth. Laying there dying, could you do that? I don't know, but she's seen something because I'm telling you, she was a very materialistic person. She liked, right now she'd be getting me to, no matter how cold and rainy it is outside, we'd be going to Paducah's and one of them antique shops this afternoon because that's what she liked to do. The entire Bible is based on the premises of the two trees. The two trees were the first piece of knowledge ever given to Adam. And God concluded the Bible with a vision of the tree of life. Let's go to Revelations. We've done been to Genesis. Genesis 2, 9, 9 is where the tree was introduced to Adam and Eve. And the very last chapter of the Bible, it concludes. Chapter 22. About living from the, the tree of life. Revelations 22 and verse 14 says, and remember, Genesis 2 and verse 9 was where God put them in the garden. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that keep his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. The tree of life. God's Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit. Only a few know it. 
If you haven't received God's Spirit yet, and you would like to, please, we're having baptisms this afternoon. Please talk to an elder. Talk to James. Talk to Bill. Talk to John. Talk to Tony. Farrell. Any one of the elders, the ministers in here for possible baptizing. Yes, the graveyard is a very lonely, quiet place. But it won't be when God comes back. As it tells us in Revelations 26. Laugh like a flame. It's over. Don't waste time. Make every second count because you're going to be accountable for it. Time is ever moving faster. Look at what is happening in the last couple of weeks. Russian President Putin meets with Obama. The Pope is in town. Castro, he hasn't been around for 60 years, I think. His brother was with Obama too. Our weather has went from bad to vicious. Tornadoes, hurricanes, fires. God has seen enough. He's getting tired of this. Jesus Christ is making the final arrangements as I speak. He tells us to pray first for thy kingdom to come. And it's going to very soon. Yes, the loneliest, the, yes, the, the lonely graveyard are quite right now. But it's all about to change. Things are about to change. I asked you, I asked you, are you ready? I asked you, are you ready to meet God? Are you ready to meet God now? Are you putting off being baptized for some reason? Well, if you don't have God's spirit and something was to happen, accident or something, that would mean the kingdom of God or the white throne judgment. Why? Why are you putting off something that God is calling you to do? Are you trying to get closer to God? Or is God in your way? Do you think you can't be replaced? Do you ever have somebody that had a job that think nobody else could do that job? Well, God can. He can give your crown away to someone else. The tree of life. God's spirit in you. Don't let it go out. Keep it fired up. It is the only way you can get out of this painful, sorrowful, mean, hateful, sick world. It is through the tree of life, God's Spirit in you. Christ will raise you when he comes back and returns. Remember, God the Father raised Christ. Christ will raise us. And then what? You know, it goes on. Thank you.